Tasmadhyasya Maha Bhagho Nigri Hitani Sarvasha Indriya Nindriya Teshbyas Indriya Nindriya Tebyas Tasya Bhagya Pratishtita Therefore, or are mighty harmed, one whose senses are restrained from their objects is certainly a steady of steady intelligence. One purport of Shri Prabhupada, one can curb the forces of sense gratification only by means of Krishna consciousness or engaging all the senses in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. As enemies are curbed by superior force, the strength is the senses can similarly be curbed, not by any human endeavor, but only by keeping them engaged in the service of the Lord. One who has understood this, that only by Krishna consciousness is one really established in intelligence, and that one should practice this art under the guidance of bona fide spiritual master, is called Sadaka or a suitable candidate for liberation. All right. And so Prabhupada introduces this word sadaka. Sadaka meaning a practitioner, somebody who is actually practicing bhakti yoga. And he, Prabhupada describes a sadaka here as a, a suitable candidate for liberation. So somebody wants liberation, they have to practice. And as Prabhupada said, they have to practice under the guidance of the spiritual teacher. And they have to practice things, you know, there's, there's two parts. One is the, you know, the four regulated principles, the things we have to give up. And then there's the things we have to do. What do we have to do? We have to, we have to chant. We have to read the books, we have to worship Krishna, we have to offer our food, we should take prasada, these kind of things. So, this is the sadhaka, the life sat, and the, when the sadhaka becomes pure devotee, then he becomes a nitya siddha, siddha. <laughs> so, the sadhaka and siddha. Sadhaka is one who's becoming pure, and siddha is the one who's already pure already perfect. So Prabhupada describes the process that we have to use the senses. He said the senses are restrained from their objects. The senses mean of course are, we have the, 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 the five senses, five, they're called knowledge acquiring senses, namely the eyes, the nose, the tongue, and then the ears, and the skin. They're the five knowledge acquiring sense. And then the sense objects, they have to, the senses have to be restrained from their objects. So the objects of the senses, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, touching, like that. So, <laughs> Prabhupada is explaining that the process is to use the senses in the service of Krishna. Somebody may think we have to stop the senses. When you read this translation, it sounds like you have to stop. Stop everything. Don't smell, don't look, don't touch, don't taste, don't hear. <laughs> you know, like... Uh, we say, see no evil, hear no evil, touch, no, or like that. But the process in Krishna consciousness is to use the senses, but for the service of Krishna. Positive engagement of the senses in the service of Krishna. And Prabhupada explains, if we're always engaged in the service of Krishna, then there's no room for maya. You cannot, you cannot, you won't have any problems with the material energy. We just have to keep ourselves always busy in Krishna consciousness. That's the important point. So, Krishna consciousness is meant to be like that. It's meant to be uh, 
continuous, uninterrupted. I don't know how it is in Switzerland, but in you know cities these days, like in the, in uh, Bangkok or Tokyo or Hong Kong, they have these shops open twenty four hours a day, never close. Do you have them like that in Switzerland? Twenty four seven. No, there is no here in Switzerland. No, no. I'm glad to hear that. You're still <laughs> you're still civilized. <laughs> but these places, these cities are so degraded. You know, people work all day and all night. They have the store, the shop open all day and so anyway, the point is devotional service is a bit like that. But then we have to be always busy in Krishna consciousness. But does it mean we cannot sleep? No, of course, we have to sleep. But, you know, we, we our sleeping is also for Krishna service. So that our body will be strong and fresh and we'll be able to serve Krishna the next day. That's the idea. If you don't sleep then you'll become very tired and you'll collapse one, one day, you just fall down, so tired. So it's important to get some rest. And uh, so that's not against devotional service. It's also for in order so that we can serve Krishna. And we don't say don't eat, but we say eat Krishna prasadam, everything in relation to Krishna, right? Use the senses for Krishna's pleasure hear about Krishna, chant for Krishna, smell the flowers offered to Krishna, see the deities, use the eyes, see the deities, all of these things. Okay. Any question? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, now let, uh, let let's say now the senses are all um, senses are all engaged in uh, Krishna consciousness. Um, uh, that means uh, they are they are doing activities in Krishna consciousness. All the senses and the intelligence uh, the intelligence is also somehow in Krishna consciousness because uh, we are following. I mean, like we are in Krishna consciousness now, but. What, what about the mind? The mind seems um, out of control. It seems like um, having a, uh, it seems to be independent. It seems like working on its own. Like how, how do we uh, uh, control that? It seems like to be out of control. Well, the process is that we use intelligence to control the mind. The mind certainly has desires. That's generally how the mind acts, that our desires come from the mind, from the mental platform. So we have to control these desires by using our intelligence. And the mind may say, eat this, the mind may say, go there, do that. But the intelligence stops us. The intelligence will say, no, no, don't do that. No, don't do that. It's not good. The intelligence is the ability to discriminate, to distinguish between what's good and what's bad, what's right and what's wrong. So we have to use the intelligence. It's, it's that higher than the, the senses is the mind. The mind can direct the senses, but above the, sen above the mind is the intelligence. And the intelligence is seated next to the soul. So we, the, the intelligence gets some help from the soul because it's seated, seated next to the soul, described like this in Bhagavad Gita. So it's important for to have, not, when I speak of intelligence, I don't mean like a material IQ, you know, you got a degree or some you're a PhD. I don't mean that kind of intelligence, but I mean intelligence to distinguish, you know, the good and the bad to know what is proper, what is moral, what is honest, what is legal. Intelligence to guide us in Krishna consciousness, to follow scriptures, to act according to scripture, according to Krishna's direction. So that's how our intelligence should be trained. We have to cultivate that intelligence by hearing Bhagavad Gita. 
by hearing the Bhagavad Gita and by chanting also, by doing japa every day, it helps us to develop intelligence to control the mind. Yeah? You understand now? Uh, uh, yes, Maharaj. But, uh, uh, why is the mind uh, such, a, is such a difficult thing to control? Is it because like from time immemorial that uh, we have uh, I have acquired so much of material um, desires and material things in my in myself that the mind does not want to give it up yes it, it can be out the, the the nature of our mind is certainly influenced by our past activities our previous life the type of environment which we've been brought up in and the association which we have all of these things influence our mind the mental thoughts you associate with people you're influenced by them so they influence our thinking so it's very important to train the mind make the mind a friend you have to dis we have to discipline the mind to get the mind to do what we want, not to let the mind act as it wants. Sometimes our mind becomes so powerful, it controls us. It gets us to do things and we don't know why I did it. I don't know why I did it. It was my mind, my mind just carried me away. So it's important for us to train ourselves, control the mind and the senses, controlling the mind and the senses. It's very, very, that, that is in every process of spiritual practice. There must be control of the mind and the senses. And there are different ways to do it. You know, you can do it by things like uh, austerity or practicing celibacy, brahmacharya, or uh, giving charity and going to visit holy places, these things. They can all help us to control the mind and to get control over the mind and senses. But the other way to do it is by the association with the devotee, with a good devotee. We go to the Krishna Consciousness Center and you know, devotees are there and they can guide us. And when we're in the Krishna Conscious Center, then the atmosphere is very pure and the devotees are very very regulated and they don't do any simple activities and so just by being in their presence we great we're greatly benefited with the association uh, we we reflect the qualities of the people we associate with just like you put a metal rod into the fire it will become hot like the fire it will take on all the qualities of the fire so the same way devotee, and if, if, if we go to the temple, we associate with devotees or we get the association somewhere of devotees, then it can affect us. It will help us to control our mind and senses. And it will help us to cultivate that good intelligence to fight against the, the enemies which are there, which come into the mind like lust lust and anger and greed these kind of things they enter and in, enters into the mind and can put, even our intelligence can become bewildered sometimes so it's very important to cultivate the good knowledge and the good intelligence by regularly hearing spiritual knowledge from bhagavad-gita and by doing regular practice like chanting of the holy name and also the, the food which we eat is also important. This also affects our consciousness and the way we think and activity. So when you can eat food which is a vegetarian, which is offered to Krishna, prepared by devotees, very helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Sanmai 
मुने translation what is night for all beings in the time of awakening for the self controlled and the time for awakening for all beings is night for the introspective sage i'm sorry i will read it again what is night for all beings is the time of awakening for the self controlled and the time of awakening for all beings is the night for the introspective sage purport by shila prabhupada these are two classes of intelligent men there are two classes of intelligent men one is intelligent in material activities for sense gratification and the other is introspective and awake to the cultivation of self realization activities of the introspective sage or thoughtful man are night for persons materially absorbed materialistic persons remain asleep in such a night due to their ignorance of self realization the introspective sage remains alert in the night of the materialistic man the sage feels transcendental pleasure in the gradual advancement of spiritual culture whereas the man in materialistic activities being asleep to self realization dreams of varieties of sense pleasure feeling sometimes happy and sometimes distressed in this sleeping condition the introspective man is always indifferent to materialistic happiness and distress he goes on with his self realization activities undisturbed by material reactions a yeah, very nice verse comparing the the devotee to the materialist and we can see how our lives are so different one who is a devotee and one who is a materialist they just have very different consciousness very different moods very different kind of uh timetable or way of living the lifestyle is so different therefore lord krishna says what is it what what is like day for the devotee that is night for the materialist just like devotees generally as devotees we like to wake up at quite early in the morning you know if you have a temple nearby you know the devotees in the temple they will be up maybe by 4:00 and they have mongol arti by 4:30 but the people who are materialists you know they're coming home about 4:00 in the morning and they're going to sleep about 4:00 you know uh, they go to sleep in the late morning and in, in the morning early morning and they wake up very late in the day like that they're awake all night devotees they sleep we sleep in the night wake up in the day but for the materialists they look forward to the night and they think about their the night life you know <laughs> they don't think the night is for sleeping or for resting they think the night is for their enjoyment in so many ways we are opposite to the, the lifestyle of the devotee and the materialists they're so different the food we eat the way we eat the way we live the way they live there's so many differences you know they like to watch all kinds of movies and bollywood movies and different things on television and so on but the devotee just wants to chant hari krishna and uh, maybe read bhagavad gita <laughs> it's so different everything is so different for a devotee 
between the devotee and the, the materialist. So Lord Krishna has compared the two paths. One is like, what is, what is our night is their day, and what is our day is their night. Is that clear? Everyone understand this verse? Yes, sir. Yes. I understand. Yes. They have told it as day and night because uh, night means darkness and uh, means uh, night means uh, which they cannot understand, Guru Maharaj. The materialistic person, they cannot understand. It's like that. Mm. Well, uh, yes, we could say it also like that in terms of the ability. They cannot understand our life and we have difficulty to understand their life, you know. They say we must be crazy to give up everything or to turn away from the, the life of material sense enjoyment to stop eating meat, fish and eggs, to stop gambling and intoxication and illicit sex. They say we must be crazy, but we say they're crazy. So yeah, we have, you could call it ignorance that what they think, you know, they have a lot of knowledge about how to enjoy, how to get their sense gratification. They're very expert, they have many plans, how they're going to get money and how they're going to spend their money and they like to do so many things for their sense gratification. And devotee, for a devotee has no meaning. Devotee is not attracting, not interested. Just like Srila Prabhupada described, he said one day he was walking in the street of Calcutta and he happened to meet someone he had remembered from his childhood days, an old school friend. So this, this man said to him, he said, I'm, I'm going to the cinema. Come with me to the cinema. And, but Prabhupada said to him, he said, no, no, I cannot go with you to the cinema. I'm not going to go to the cinema. He said, even you give me uh, so many thousands of rupees or hundreds, whatever, even you give me a huge sum of money, I'm not going to come with you to the cinema. I said, I don't want to sit there and watch a cinema. <laughs> but for the man, he was surprised because he was thinking, you know, this is enjoyment. This is my pleasure. But to Srila Prabhupada, there was no pleasure at all to go and sit in a cinema house and watch some reflections on a screen. So like that, what is night for one person is day for another. Dif totally opposite ways of thinking and ways of seeing the world. Mm -hmm. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Batma Mataji, do you want to read this? 2.70 Apuryamanam achala pratishtam samudram apa pravishyanti asvat tadvat kamayam Pravishyanti Sarvesha Shantim Apnotina Kama Kami. Translation A person who is not disturbed by the incessant flow of desires that enter like rivers into the ocean, which is ever being filled but is always still, can alone achieve peace and not the man who strives to satisfy such desires. Purpose. Although the vast ocean is always filled with water, it is always, especially during the rainy season, being filled with much more water. But the ocean remains the same steady. It is not agitated, nor does it cross behind the limit of its brain. 
that is also true of a person fixed in krishna consciousness as long as one as the material body the demands of the body for sense gratification will continue the devotee however is not disturbed by such desire because of his fullness a krishna conscious man is not in need of anything because the lord fulfills all his material necessities therefore he is like the ocean always full in himself desires may come to him like the waters of the river that flow into the ocean but he is steady in his activities and he is not even slightly disturbed by desires for sense gratification that is the proof of a krishna conscious man one who has lost all inclinations for material sense gratification although the desires are present because he remains satisfied in the transcendental loving service of the lord he can remain steady like the ocean and therefore enjoy full peace others however who want to fulfill desires even up to the limit of liberation want to seek of material success can never attain peace the fruity workers the solvationists and also the yogis who are after mystic power are all unhappy because of unfulfilled desires but the person in krishna consciousness is happy in the service of the lord and he has no desires to be fulfilled in fact he does not even desire liberation from the so called material bondage the devotees of krishna have no material desires and therefore they are in perfect peace yes very nice example given by lord krishna just like the rivers enter into the sea but the ocean itself remains always still so the comparing these this rivers to the desires entering into the mind because we have a material body because we have material senses and because we are conditioned also so desires are going to be there but even though desires come in the mind we don't act right we described here a devotee he just, he's peaceful he doesn't need anything he's not anxious for anything other people they all want something and some people want material sense gratification some people want liberation some people want yogic powers they all want something bhukti mukti siddhi kami sakale ashanta you know the, none of them are peaceful krishna bhakti niskam sai shashanta but a devotee he's peaceful because he has he has no material desire he's happy just to chant hari krishna and to serve krishna and so even though the opportunity for sense gratification comes he doesn't just want it doesn't mean anything to him because he's happy he's getting some greater pleasure in serving krishna his relationship with krishna so a devotee in krishna consciousness is very careful to avoid sinful activities even though these desires come in the mind we have the intelligence to control the senses right we have to have that good intelligence just like you know the mind may think oh there's so much money in the bank let me rob the bank <laughs> you know so you can under you know if you rob the bank you know what's going to happen you know you're going to get caught by the police and you'll go to jail for a long time so a devotee is very careful we use our intelligence why should i do that you know it doesn't make any sense to suffer just be happy be satisfied with what we've got and chant hari krishna an experience peace of mind experience the pleasure of the soul so that is the idea we want to be peaceful we don't want to be always uh, trying to get more trying to get try more let me try this let me try that let me do this let me go there let me oh the mind can be very restless so we have to just calm down and be peaceful going to be peaceful just 
take shelter of Krishna and you know, think, I'm just going to chant Hare Krishna, I'm going to read the Bhagavad Gita. I don't want anything more. So it's a practice. We have to train ourselves. We have to train the mind to be settled in that. Then, then it becomes natural, second nature. Hmm. So it's a nice example Krishna's giving, yeah, an analogy. It's like the rivers enter into the sea. We see the Ganga, Mother Ganga. She has so much water, and the water's all flowing to the sea and into the water. It flows very fast. The current in the Ganga is very strong. But the sea still remains calm. The sea doesn't get overthrown by all the water entering in. And so we should keep our mind also, even though so many thoughts come in the mind. Oh, just neglect the mind. That's the point. We have to learn, when the mind is desiring, just think, oh, here, my mind is going again. Here's my mind off again. Let just, when the mind starts thinking all these thoughts, then it's time you have to really pray to Krishna, take shelter of Krishna by loudly chanting the holy name. Pray to Krishna, oh, Krishna, please protect me from my, please protect me from all these sinful desires. Hmm. So, the other, other way in which to control the mind is to keep ourselves always active in Krishna's service. So one way, is, you know, you're trying to pray to Krishna to help you not to listen to the mind and all its thoughts and desires. And the other way is to keep herself always busy in Krishna consciousness, doing service for Krishna. And then we're safe. When we're always busy, then these thoughts will not come in the mind. The thoughts come in the mind because we're not engaged enough. We're not doing enough. We have a saying, we say that the idle mind is a devil's workshop. So if the mind is not fully engaged, if we're not keeping our mind busy in the service of Krishna, then the mind will become engaged in the service of the devil and are in the service of Maya. So I have to be on guard. And always remember Krishna, right? That's the ultimate principle. Always remember Krishna, never forget him. And that, then we're saying, if we're remembering Krishna, then we won't be subject to these material desires. Everyone agree? Everyone agree? No response? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. But Guru Maharaj, sometimes uh, we, even when we are doing Krishna conscious activities, we will do some mistakes here and there. I agree. And then uh, if we become restless, that is material or how is it, Guru Maharaj? We become restless? Well, yeah, some mistakes we will do with the devotees while dealing with the devotees. Something that we do, we didn't do, do our best nicely, present Krishna conscious or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, we should always want to try and improve our service. Yeah, it's good. It's good to see our mistakes and think how we can do better. It's very nice. You don't want to be thinking I did everything perfect. You should always want to see our own faults and think, oh, I, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, I didn't do so well. I hope I try to do better next time. That's very good. It's a good attitude. And if we're thinking I did very good, very nice, everything perfect. No, that's not very good. But if we're thinking, I didn't do very well, I've got to improve, that's good. We want to try harder and do more for the service of Krishna. Yeah? So restlessness, 
Yeah, restlessness, the agitation of the mind. The mind that you have to control the mind. You have to be steady. And we have to know what is our proper engagement. The mind always is, wants to go here and there. Do you have to you have to control the mind and just fix it. Serve Krishna. Mr. Maharaj. But uh, sometimes, Guru Maharaj, we have phobias, right? I have a phobia, like uh, sometimes uh, uh, I cannot go in the lift. And so I know it's the problem with the mind, how to deal with all this, which means that we are not fully dependent on Krishna. It's like that, Guru Maharaj. Yes, <laughs> yeah, we could think like that. We have to we have to depend on Krishna. You have some phobias, something maybe from the childhood, from the past. Develop this kind of phobia. We can overcome it, but it's not a big problem. It's a little phobia like that. You don't like to go and live. Some people they don't like to go in airplanes. You know, there are some, you know, really big, powerful men. They won't go in an airplane. They're very afraid to go in airplanes. But. Uh, you know, these kind of phobias, they're small things, you know. Yeah, we could say it's because we're not fully depending on Krishna. We have to know Krishna is protecting us. We live by the grace of Krishna and we die by the plan of Krishna. You know, we can't do anything. We're not the controller. It's all in Krishna's hands. So it all requires our surrender to Krishna. And so part of surrender is to know that Krishna is protecting all of us. He protects us, he maintains us. We have to just simply surrender to him. So again, it, it, this phobia, is, it, 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 it's the mind. The mind is un, out of control. We're becoming, we develop this, oh, I'm afraid of this, I don't like this, I don't like that. This is the nature of the mind. And so many other people, they go in the lift, so many other people, they fly. Why shouldn't you? Why shouldn't I? You know, we have to simply de detach ourselves from all of these situations and take shelter of Krishna. Of course, it's, it, it's not easy. It takes time. It takes practice. We are conditioned. We've been in the material world a long time. And because we've been in, so long in the material world, so we have so much conditioning. We have so many doubts, so many thoughts, so many phobias, so many habits. And it takes time to rectify all of these and to give them up and change. It's not easy. But patience and confidence and enthusiasm, then gradually can come about. One day you may find yourself in the lift, you didn't even think about it, and you're in the lift and you go up to the you go up to the stair. <laughs> Sometimes it's like that. You know, because we're so much on the mental platform. Oh no, no, I can't. But one day you just go in there, you didn't even think about it, you didn't even realize you were in the lift and you know, you realize nothing there, not a big problem. So like that, phobias, these things can be a problem for us. But we want to be conscious. We want to be Krishna conscious. Some devotees say, first become conscious and then become Krishna conscious. Some people are not even conscious. You see, they do things, just do things mechanically and sporadically. And they're not even conscious that they're doing it. They're not, they're not even conscious that, you know, they have bad habits or they're using bad language or they're living in a very impure, contaminated place. They don't even think about it. They're not, they have no consciousness. So first people have to become conscious. And then they have to go on and become Krishna conscious. 
It's the, higher the highest level of consciousness. Right? Yes. Guru Maharaj, I have a small question. So during some puja we perform to Krishna, we may do some mistakes, right? Maybe forgetting to offer prasadam to Krishna or giving arti at the end. Some small mistakes will all be will be considered as some you know sins. No, Krishna considers your devotion. That what what was your mood in doing this? You know, it, the, the, if you had the mood of the devotion that you wanted to offer something to Krishna. That's the important thing. Krishna is not so much concerned about all these different rules and regulations, but, you know, he likes to see that mode of genuine devotion. We see Putana, you know, Putana came with poison on her breast. She wants to kill Krishna. But Krishna just said, oh, she wants to feed me. She wants to be my mother. And so Krishna took her back to Godhead. Hmm. So these kind of things, you know. If, if, so certainly you're making an attempt with devotion to worship Krishna. Maybe you did things in a little different way from what they're usually done. But the important thing is you did something. You offered something to Krishna. That's the important thing. Krishna sees that you made this attempt to serve him, to please him. So certainly, it's very nice. You'll be, he's, Krishna is very happy. He will bless you for, for making this attempt. At the same time, we don't want to go on all the time and take advantage and just do everything the wrong way, just do everything as we like. We try to do everything in a manner according to the prescribed rules, the different rules and regulations. That's, that's also good for us. And it pleases Krishna when he sees that we're sincerely trying to follow everything, to do everything properly. But he understands also, you know, somebody's, you know, not so experienced and they, they do something a little wrong. Krishna, Krishna knows everyone's heart. Krishna knows what's happening. He understands everything. So I don't think you have to worry about any kind of offense because your devotion would overcome any of that, these offenses. That's the important thing, the devotion, the genuine attempt to please Krishna. All Thank right? you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, most of us are being controlled by the three modes of material nature. And in the same time, uh, they have this uh, minute uh, independence. Mm. So how, how do we differentiate the, that uh, being controlled by the three modes of material nature and having this uh, minute in independence, Maharaj? Yes, our independence is either to su surrender to the material energy or to surrender to the spiritual energy. We have that independence, that much independence. We can choose either to serve Krishna or not to serve Krishna. And when we don't serve Krishna, then we're serving Maya. So in both cases, we're controlled. It's interesting that if, if we surrender to Krishna, Krishna controls us. And when we surrender to Maya, then Maya controls us. We're never free. We, you know, but our independence is to choose where do we want to serve? Do we want to serve under Krishna or under the material, under the Maya? That's our free will. That's our choice. And once we make that, that choice, then that's it. We come under the material energy and then it's arranged. Either we're in the mode of goodness goodness or passion or ignorance. It will depend on our some scars, on our vasanas, on our mental conditions in the past and so on will place us in a different in a particular situation of the modes of nature. But we're not free. The free will is only to choose 
Krishna or Maya? Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. I also have one question, Gurudev. Yeah. When we do the RT, we rotate the lambs three or uh, like four times on the feet of the of Lord, then two times near the navel, then, then, then again three times round the face, and seven times around, like around the Lord. Why is it? Why so many? Why? What's the meaning of that, Guru? Well, it doesn't have to be exactly like that, but this is just some, you know, this is just to give us some guidelines about how we can offer the lamp to the Lord. It's not that there's any special significance in the number of times you circle these different parts of the body. You know, it's just to help us to know roughly how we can offer something to the Lord. So generally, we offer something, first of all, to the feet of the Lord. We begin our meditation. Okay. The, we begin the meditation from the feet, right? We, because the Lord is he, he's yeah. the supreme. He's the superior. And when we come before a, a superior person, we bow before them. And so we look at the deity. We look first at the lotus feet of the Lord. And we offer worship yes, there yes. to the feet, and yes. then you come up and come up the, to the the waist of the Lord, then to the face of the Lord, and then the overall body body of the Lord. Yeah, this this is just to guide us in how we can make an offering, what kind of procedure we should have in offering articles to the Lord, and we do the same okay, when we thank worship. You for when we worship Tosi, it's the same thing. We offer, yeah. first of all, to the root, and then up, and then to the top, uh, like that. Uh -huh. We have one more question, Gurudev. Now, uh, yeah. normally we do the, we do the, uh, the, uh, the Agarbati first, and then the, and then the lamb. After that, only we, like, you know, we do the bathing, and then we wipe the, we wipe the body. But normally, what I think, maybe I'm wrong, Gurudev. We should bathe first and then wipe and then show the arti. Isn't it most of the temples, that's how they do? Why in ISKCON they show the lamp first? And after that, you know, they do the bathing procedure? Well, we're not actually bathing the deity, for sure. No, with the, with the corn shell, we take the water, no? And then we take it down. Yes, but it's not actually bathing the deity. It's just an offering. We're offering the different elements of the nature to the Lord. Okay. So earth, fire, water, air, like that. These are the different elements of the Lord. Okay, so and that's what he means. Mm -hmm. Then again, we wipe with the, with, the, with the handkerchief, with the cloth. Yeah, but we don't actually wipe. Do we? We just simply offer that article. These are yes. different articles. There's a different articles which are prescribed to be offered to the deity. Suitable articles to be offered to the deity at the time of worship. So this is a this is a tradition that I don't know which temples you've seen, but I've, not, I've never seen other temples where they offer the water first. No, no not Iskon temples, not Iskon temples, Gurudev. Most of the other temples, even, even the Tirupati, they also, first, first they put, uh, they put haldi, and then they put, uh, they put uh, milk, and then, and then they bathe. After, at the end of it, they do the arti. Well, the arti, that's what we're doing. We're just doing the arti. The bathing is done privately, right? But we're just doing the RT, they blow the conch yeah. and they offer the incense. That's the RT. We only see the RT. The bathing of the deity is not done publicly usually. Unless, yeah, it's, that's a, done separate. Yeah. unless it's a very special festival. But we're following in the Godia Vaishnav Sampradaya, and they have the different uh, teachings, you know, probably Tirupati 
they're not Gaudiya Vaishnavas, you know, they're maybe, maybe that I don't know, maybe it's from Shankaracharya or maybe it's Sri Vaishnava. But we had the Sri Vaishnavas come to our Tirupati temple and they installed the deities there, Tirupati. Yes. So we don't have any problem with the Sri Vaishnavas, but maybe the other people, the followers of Shankaracharya, you know, they may have their own pujas, I don't know. I haven't associated, I don't associate with them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good there. Thank you so much. But the Gaudiya, the, the Gaudiya Mat and the Iskon, and they're all following Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in the line of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, they all offered like that. Okay. I've seen in the Gaudiya Mat how they do it. Gaudiya Mat Ashram. That came from Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati. And Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, he came from Bhakti Vinod Thakur. And before that, you know, the Vrindavan, in Vrindavan, generally they do it like that. In Vrindavan, they will worship like that. Okay. Thank you, Gurudev. Two point seven. Uh, one. Uh, um, keep it up. Who wants to read it? Anyone wants to read this? Two point seven. Read. Yes, yes, Mataji. Vihaya kamam ya sarvan Umam starati nispraha Nirmano nirahankara Sasanti madigachati Translation A person who has given up all desires for sense gratification, who lives free from desires, who has given up all sense of proprietorship and is devoid of false ego, he alone can attain real peace. Perfect. To, give, <clears throat> to become desireless means not to desire anything for sense gratification. In other words, desire for becoming Krishna conscious is actually desirelessness. To understand one's actual position as the eternal servant of Krishna without falsely claiming this material body to be oneself, and without falsely claiming proprietorship over anything in the world is the perfect stage of Krishna consciousness. One who is situated in this perfect stage knows that because Krishna is a proprietor of everything, everything must be used for the satisfaction of Krishna. Arjuna did not want to fight for his own sense, satisfac for his own sense satisfaction, but when he became fully Krishna conscious, he fought because Krishna wanted him to fight. For himself, there was no desire to fight. But for Krishna, the same Arjuna fought to his best ability. Real desirelessness is desire for the self, is desire for the satisfaction of Krishna and not an artificial attempt to abolish desires. The living entity cannot be desireless or senseless, but it does not have to change the quality of the desires. A materially desireless person certainly knows that everything belongs to Krishna. Isha Vashyam Idam Sarvam. And therefore, he does not falsely claim proprietorship over anything. This transcendental knowledge is based on self-realization, namely, knowing perfectly well that every living entity is an eternal part and parcel of Krishna in spiritual identity and that eternal position of the living entity is therefore never on the level of Krishna or greater than him. The understanding of Krishna consciousness is the basic principle of real peace. Okay, so <laughs> a number of different qualities are described. First of all, to become desireless. And someone may think, Desirelessness means to make the mind blank, but that is not the Krishna conscious process. You know, the impersonalists, they want to make the mind blank, but a devotee of Krishna doesn't want to make the mind blank. 
The devotee of Krishna wants to fill the mind with thought of Krishna. Remembering Krishna's pastimes, Krishna's qualities, Krishna's different activities, different incarnations and avatars, right? That, that is, uh, and Prabhupada said, that is desirelessness, when our mind is full in Krishna consciousness. So, again, different, very different. We don't want to make, we know we can't make the mind blank, because it's not the nature of the mind. It's na the nature of the mind is to be active. The nature of the soul is active. We have to know how to be active, what, in what ways we can be active. That's important for us. To try to stop activity and do nothing. I mean, people think, someone may think all activity is maya, it's all illusion. We should not do anything. Some people, they sit down and they meditate and make the mind blank, nothing, meditate on nothing. How long can they do it? And this is, that is not practical, to just sit and make the mind blank and do nothing. That is not the goal of life. But these people, some people who do this, they're thinking that there's no God and the world is not real and everything is illusion. So they stop everything. But Krishna consciousness is a very different process. So we want to desire for Krishna, not to be without desire, but to have all desires in relation to Krishna. And, and then we should not think of ourselves as the proprietor of anything. We claim this is mine, this belongs to me, this is mine. Oh, we have a saying, you know, I, I remember in, uh, in the, that we're, we're born with kalihath ayate, kalihath chelo, right? That we're born with nothing in our hand, and when we leave, we'll have nothing in our hand. When we leave the body, we'll have nothing in our hand. So what is actually ours? You know, we claim the proprietorship. This is mine. I made this. I bought this. This belongs to me. Ultimately, it's all Krishna's. So Prabhupada quotes that verse about Isya Vashyam Idam Sarvam Yakincha Jagat Yam Jagat. Everything animate and inanimate that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. This is the first mantra of the Ishopanishad. Ishopanishad, Prabhupada had translated and wrote commentary on the Ishopanishad. So everything animate and inanimate that is within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord. We should accept, therefore, only those things necessary for ourselves. And we should not take more than we need, knowing well to whom it belongs. So that's, an, that's an, a principle of Krishna consciousness. That just take what we need. Don't take more than we actually need. Don't be greedy. Try to always just minimize and optimize. Don't, don't maximize. <laughs> don't try to expand, but try to check. Keep a check. Try to bring the... Just like eating, you know, we don't want to eat too much. You try to reduce, don't overeat. Don't undereat, but at the same time, you don't want to overeat. And so, in relation to acquiring things and property and controlling, try to minimize, see everything is Krishna's property. A, de a devotee understands everything belongs to Krishna. The house is also Krishna's. Put Krishna in the center of the house and worship Krishna every day. When we cook food, we offer it to Krishna. We think he's the proprietor. It's all his. He gave the food. He provided for us. We're offering to what is actually his. He doesn't need our offerings, but we need, we need to offer it to him. Krishna has many goddesses of fortune all serving him in the spiritual world. So he doesn't need our offerings, 
what we need to offer to Krishna because it does a lot of benefit for us. It helps us to have the good consciousness, knowing that everything is Krishna's. Okay? Any more questions? We had a lot of questions today. Very good. All right, maybe we should Hare Krishna now. Yes, Guru Maharaj. We can do start with the chanting, Guru Maharaj. There is some chat message. Yeah. There's a chat message? Really? What's Krishna, Mata, Udev, Prabhupada were married, so they had. What's that? Uh, Prabhu, uh, Krishna, Mah Mahadev, Prabhupada were married, so they had desires because one marries one who loves. Uh, maybe, I don't Krishna, know. Krishna, Mahadev, Prabhupada were married. Yeah, so they had desire. <laughs> yes, but they did not marry for sense gratification. Marriage is not just for indulging the senses and sense gratification. Marriage is a responsibility for the service of Krishna. And Krishna also took a, a responsibility in getting married. And similarly, Mahadev also and Srila Prabhupada. It's a responsibility. It's a responsibility to take care of a family and to bring Krishna conscious children into the world and raise them to be devotees so that they can go back home, back to Godhead. And so that, that is service to Krishna. It, it's not a material desire. So we're talking, you know, don't think everything is material. You, you, you understand, you think that it's material desires? You think Krishna was lusty? You think Prabhupada was lusty or Lord Shiva was lusty? Lord Shiva, he's, he, he, he's, very sense controlled. He's very sober minded, Dira. So, you know, there's, there's ex so many examples of Lord Shiva, how he was so controlled and not at all agitated. And Lord Krishna has so many wives, but one of Lord Krishna's opulences is renunciation. He's not attached to any of them. Although they're so beautiful, the most beautiful women in the universe, they're all there as Krishna's wives. But Lord Krishna is not attached to them. But he takes care of them and he looks after them and he keeps them happy. And they have children. That's the duty. Is it clear? Who asked that question? <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Uh, very much to understand. Okay, thank you, Simon. Prabhu. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, nice. Nice, Simon. Thank you. All right, we're going to chant Japa now. Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasa Degor Bhat